in a series right now called You Ask For It. In other words, the content that I preach from is based on questions and desires from you that I would speak on these subjects. And so this weekend, I want to tackle the subject that's really, I would say, it's tense. And, um, and yet, I believe it needs to be spoken on. Now, here at City Church, you know, we're blessed. We have 40 nationalities that come to our church, all types of ethnicities, different ages. And from a church perspective, really backgrounds from all you know, church denominations and backgrounds. And yet, we've had a lot of questions in different forums, different groups that we've done. You know, questions on race. What's our role in our nation? What's our role in Bloomington? How do I see things? How does the church see things? And so we've gotten a lot of questions on this subject. And so I want to preach this weekend uh, based on questions I've received on the topic, what does Jesus say about race? And I believe we're going to be strengthened and encouraged to take our next steps. Amen? Let me say a few things before I get started. Uh, I never preach politics because I believe any church that does that from any side of politics is wasting people's times, or uh, it's wasting their time, excuse me, and it's not what God's called us to do. I, don't, I just don't believe in it, so I'm never going to do that here at City. I'm not here to preach at people. I'm not here to sway people on sides. I'm here to preach the Word of God and that you and I would take our next steps. Please hear me. This message is not going to change the nation. Um, it's just not. Um, now, Jesus has the power to change the nation. So I'm not trying to have this huge message that I'm going to change the world. What I'm asking you and I to do today in this message is that everyone in this room and online would take two steps. And I'm going to preach what those are, two steps. And that you and I would simply embrace a higher plane, how Jesus would ask us to see this issue. And then in our world, where we go, we would simply take these two steps. Because I believe the church needs to show the world who the healer is. That's just my view, okay? And so I want to preach from John chapter 4. If you've been around church, you may have heard this message or or this chapter preached on in in a variety of ways. Jesus goes to a well. There's a woman. She has a, you know, a scandalous past. Her life has changed. What we often don't preach from the perspective, which is biblical, is from a race relations perspective. And I want to do that today. And then I want to show you what Jesus did. He did two things as I see it, as the Holy Spirit showed me. And then I want to translate that into how you and I can take our next steps on these two things. Amen? So in verse 4, follow me on the screen. And I believe that God can do anything. How about you? I believe the devil's a liar. How about you? He's a lying wonder. Jesus is Lord. Okay, I just wanted to say that. Verse 4, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, notice this, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And so we've had tons of questions come in on this, on this subject, asked in a variety of forums and settings. And I chose one question to really use for this weekend's message. I thought this was indicative of my heart and what we can do at City. And the question is, what's my role with the issues we have, and I think they're speaking of America, that we have regarding race? I feel it's so big, what can I do? And so let me say this. I do not think it's wrong for a church to be all white, all black, all Asian, all Hispanic, or et cetera. I don't you know, think that's wrong. There's a lot of places in our nation that's simply not integrated And so the churches are going to reflect um, one dominant ethnicity. That's fine. It is, however, my conviction that if a church is in an area that is diverse, that that church should strive for diversity and worship together. I want to share a stat, and before I want to share with you what happened in a conversation I had. I was having lunch with a pastor, very well-educated man, great leader, great church. He knew about our church and our diversity and in my marriage and all that. 
And he said something that hurt me. He said, you know, I'm tired. Guess what he said? I'm tired of everyone saying that Sunday is still the most segregated day of the week. I'm tired of that. He said, we worship different. He said, you worship you know, the way you worship, and we worship the way we, uh, the way we worship, and we should be fine with that and go wherever you want, and I'm tired of this being brought up. And I thought that was indicative of American culture on this subject. It would be easier to stay separate, but I don't think it would be the heart of God to do so. You and I can say statements like that and totally miss the heart of God. And so it's my conviction that we don't settle, and we're not at City, but we're not settling for those type of statements. The fact that we do worship different is the very reason we should worship together. Because one day we're going to be in heaven together. So we better get used to it right now. Right? That's how I see it. This is an example in American culture. There's over 430,000 churches in America. Only 4%, only 4% of churches in America are diverse based on this stat that that church would have at least 20% of its congregation be a different ethnicity. Only 4%, coast to coast, border to border, which says to me that by and large, I'm speaking you know, on the big church scale, we're not worshiping together still. That there's gaps here when we come together. And so how do we solve this? What do we do? Jesus wants better for us. The first thing that Jesus did in, in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 is simply Jesus looked across the street. Say that with me. Look across the street. Now, we don't often go here in Scripture, but we need to. Here's, the, here's this, the blunt truth. In Jewish culture, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish children were taught that Samaritans were half-breeds. They were taught that they should not marry them. They should not be around them. They're separate from us. We are God's people. They are not. Just read history. Read the scriptures. You will see Jesus was taught this same thing. As a Jewish boy, he would have been instructed on these lines about Samaritans. And I want you to see this chapter and what Jesus did. The Bible says in verse 4 that he had to go to Samaria. If I could show you a map, it, um, the route he took was almost like a half circle. And it was 37 miles. Jesus walked 37 miles. When's the last time any of us walked 37 miles in one day? We haven't. To the fridge and back to the couch, right? Doesn't count. Jesus walked 37 miles to go to Samaria. When he was doing that, you got to know, he was breaking racial rules, crossing racial lines. Not only that, Jesus went to a village in Samaria called Sychar. If you look this up in the Greek language, it literally means the place of liars and drunks. I love the fact that Jesus will go out of his way for you and I. And that not only does he go out of his way, but he goes to an ugly place and confronts it head on to bring healing to our lives. Jesus is not embarrassed of our ugliness. In that city church, we believe we all have ugliness at times. Nervous laugh in the back, but it's true anyhow. <laughs> all right? And that Jesus goes to that. So Jesus looks across the street. He breaks racial rules. He crosses racial lines. Jesus does this, and he engages in a conversation with a woman he should not be talking to, and her whole world has changed. She has a, a scandalous background, six men in and out of her life. Jesus was the seventh man, and he changed her world forever. But this speaks to you and I. How, you know, as we transpose this, how do you and I look across the street? Now, I don't think this is wrong, but stay with me in this analogy. I think it's our propensity that as people, we live on our side of the street, how we vote, how we worship, where we come from, how we do life. And, we, and it's our temptation to stay on that side of the street and just kind of live life that way. And again, I don't think that's wrong in and of itself. But I believe as a Christ follower, you and I are called to a higher position. You see, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, the Apostle John said, If you and I do not love our brother and sister, this is a strong language, then the love of God is not in you. So I say it this way. We love a God that we can't see 
to empower us to love people that we do see. There should be no form of bigotry in a Christian, but we know there is. We know that's true. I'll share with you a couple stories here in a moment. So Jesus is calling us to go to a higher place. So when you think about it, our natural, our natural tendency is to stay on our side of the street. Jesus didn't do that. He was intentional and walked 37 miles to break that code. So for you and I, as we look across the street, here's a couple of ways we do that to make it practical. I think it's very important that we acknowledge that our experience isn't everyone else's experience. We just It's, it's arrogance to think that you have the same uh, experience that I have. As a matter of fact, everyone in this room and online, we all have different stories. Not one of us has the same story of another. All of us have differences. So it's good and it's a humble thing to acknowledge and admit that other people's experience is different than mine. And so when I acknowledge that, it's my first step of looking across the street. How about this? No matter how you vote, which is fine here at City, no matter how you look at the Starbucks incident in Philadelphia, the latest situation in Northern California where a young man was killed in, the, in a backyard, no matter how you see those things, that's your prerogative. But we all have to admit that race is a broken system in America, and it's sadly broken in the church. So to look across the street, what we do is, as Jesus did, he walked I mean, all this way and he confronted this, is that you and I simply acknowledge that people have different experiences, and we go to the sidecar places. We go to the ugly places. We don't bury our head in the sand. We don't use spiritual terms to minimize it. We don't get worked up about politics, but we face the issues head on, and we let Jesus work in us so that we can come together and take ground one step at a time. So in a more, even more practical way, here's some thoughts. Very simple and very practical. What if you and I at City, I want to, and I want to encourage you to take advantage of being in our church, let alone here and outside of this church, what if you and I would look across the street and we would simply engage in conversations with someone different than us? Have coffee, have dinner, have lunch. You don't go preaching your agenda. You don't go arguing and changing and going bantering back and forth. You just sit down and say, tell me your story. I'll tell you my story. Let's just share. Let's just learn from one another. We just begin to talk. Like we have no political agenda. We have no, we're not going to get, in the, we're just going to sit and we're going to truly think about how powerful conversations are when two people truly listen to one another. All right. And so when you and I simply engage in conversation, that's a practical way that we look across the street. If you read the text, Jesus engaged in a conversation with this woman. And he located her pain. And he healed it. What if you and I would engage in conversation and see each other's pain and then let Jesus use us to help one another be healed? Now when I say this stat, I'm not condemning you if you're in this category. But I want to be. I want to give you an awareness of American culture in light of race. I listened to a panel on diversity, and one person said something. And then what's interesting is the famous movie A Time to Kill in the '90s had a little bit of this in it as well. Toward the end, with Samuel L. Jackson's character. But in the panel, on the panel, the gentleman said, "If you think about it, most Americans have never had dinner." or a lunch, or coffee, whatever, in someone else's home that's of a different ethnicity. Think about that. Most white people have never been in an Asian family's home to have dinner. Most Asian people have never been in a black person's home to have dinner. Most Hispanic people have not ever been in a, in a, in a white person's home to have dinner. Uh, most white people or black people or whatever, Asian, Hispanic, have never been in a Native American's home to have dinner. It speaks to American culture. It speaks to the invisible divide that's there that's played out every week. What if you and I would simply look across the street and not only will we have a conversation, here's some practical steps, I challenge all of us, if you haven't done this yet, go to someone's house or have someone to your house that's of a different ethnicity and have a good time and learn from each other. Because if we can never come together, how can God ever heal us together? If we repeat the cycle of really kind of being by each other, 
in different settings but not really knowing each other, how can we ever get free? So when I was little, I used to go to a tulip tree. It's a huge apartment building down the street. I remember every floor would smell different of different cultures of food. It was a great education. And I had the privilege of being in the Indonesian family's home as a child. I was privileged to be in the Filipino family's home. I was privileged to be in an African family's home, multiple African families' homes. I was privileged to be in all types of homes. I had a friend that was from Afghanistan as a child. So I had that opportunity, and, and I was blessed for it. But I realized, and I, I didn't have any issue with this, but I realized that we're all the same. That we have differences of culture and food and you know, music or whatever, but really we're all the same. And so to look across the street, Jesus walked 37 miles, engaged in a conversation and broke racial rules and all of that to bring healing. What if you and I would simply look across the street and acknowledge that my experience isn't yours? So I want to sit down and have a conversation to learn your experience, not to change your experience or change your view of it. And then we have maybe a dinner or we hang out and we just get together because our church groups have gone to restaurants in our city and Asian and African and African American and, and Hispanic and white. And I, and, I, and I never caught this. And this is sad because I was always around it, so I never caught it. But our church groups have gone into restaurants and people will look at us like, well, this is weird. Because it doesn't happen. Think about it. But Jesus wants better for us. If we love a God that we can't see, we have to love people that we do see. And we can't just be like the preacher that was telling me that it's okay to be separate because after all, we're different. That's an excuse. At some point, you and I have to embrace being uncomfortable so we can be healed. At some point, we have to cross the street and be uncomfortable so we can be better. Staying on our side and doing it our way, it breathes the gap that America has taught us. And I'm not trying to make you upset here today. I'm speaking truth. You and I have the privilege and the opportunity as a Christ follower to simply take a step and look across the street. For example, there's a gentleman in our church. He's here today as a part of our family. He was raised in a smaller community in Indiana, predominantly white. He was taught that if anyone looked different than him, then he shouldn't trust them or shouldn't be around them. That's what he was taught. Okay? He came to our church, I don't know why, <laughs> on the whim. He said in the first three minutes, he was totally uncomfortable, he wanted to run out. To his credit, the Holy Spirit convicted him, and he stayed. He said he was looking across the room. People were different than him, worshiping, raising his hand. He thought, I don't know what. He was, all this tension was in his mind. Then he got even crazier and went to a life group. He said the first night he walked into the life group, and he saw most of the people were not like him. He wanted to leave in the first two minutes. Again, the Holy Spirit convicted him, and he stayed through it. Over time, as he's been in our church, that ideology has been broken off of his mind. Today, he's on the dream team. Today, he's in life groups, multiple. Today, some of his closest friends are people that do not look like him because he gave God a chance to look across the street. Come on, give God praise. He can do it. He can do it. Notice the second thing. Jesus first looks across the street. The second thing in verse 8, 9, and 10 is Jesus looked at the big picture. Please say it with me. Looked at the big picture. He broke racial rules to heal. He broke racial lines to bring change. Notice this. He didn't let their division block his big picture. This is a big point. If I read the whole thing, in verse 28 and 29, the woman runs from the well, goes back to the village of liars and drunks, tells all of them what Jesus just did for her, and then they all come with her, and they all receive Jesus. Notice, through the racial tension, on the other side of that was a move of God. I know that's a kind of a church term. In other words, God moved on people. Could it be that there's a move of God through this racial tension? And there is. The answer is there is. You see, Jesus saw the big picture, and he focused on that versus his teaching that told him this woman's not even a half a human, let alone he knew her sin, and she's been with men. She, she doesn't even deserve this. He didn't do that. He didn't do it racially, physically. He didn't do it spiritually. He loved her where she's at. Aren't you glad Jesus does the same for you and I? Right? So 
Uh, let me give context to a move of God in this subject. For this subject, to me, it would look like hearts would be healed toward each other. Like we would truly have a healed heart. I'm not saying we're racist in this room or online. I don't believe that, I, or I think you'd have a hard time being here. But what I'm suggesting is, is that you and I take other steps and we just don't stay on our side of the street. And we don't let politics fracture us. You see, I believe that a move of God in this area would be hearts healed. We would worship together. And I know we do that here, but stay with me. We would be unified. How about this one? A move of God in this area would mean that people are heard. We wouldn't try to drown people's voices out because it's uncomfortable for us to listen. For example, I read an article, and in the 90s, a high-ranking politician in America said this. He said this statement. I read it. They quoted him. Racism is dead. And his reasoning was Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, and Colin Powell. And we know, and you know what? I wish that was true. I wish that statement could be true. That would be amazing. That was in the 90s. That would be amazing if that was true. And it's a lie. It's not true. It's sad, but it's not true. For example, you know, my wife and I were together on a Facebook ad for the church. We changed service times last fall. And so we were advertising to Bloomington and surrounding counties. And one of the surrounding counties and area, a man posted on the ad, he said, interracial couples, exclamation mark. Thank you, liberals. I don't think he ever came. I don't think he wants to come here. How sad. How trite. How wrong. You see, you and I can't change America and we can't change the system, but we can change our perspective and we can walk like Jesus and do this one step, one person at a time. And we can look across the street and we can look at the big picture. For example, let me give you another example of this. There was a friend of mine that has a church in the South, and in 2008, his church is, is diverse. In 2008, when President Obama was first elected for his first term, I want you to hear this story. 200 people left his church. The white people said, well, you and your church support President Obama, so we're leaving. Oh, God. The people that voted for Obama said that you're racist, and they left. And I think how sad. How sad that a Christ follower would let, a, at best, being very kind, a broken political system divide us from worshiping our God. Last I checked, we're not going to die and go to the White House forever. Aren't you glad? That place is... If Jesus doesn't come in our lifetime, last I checked from the Bible, we die and go where? Heaven. And guess what? We're all together. The Bible is clear about that as John saw it in Revelation. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, worshiping around the throne. There's going to be no segregation. We're going to be worshiping together. So to me, no church, this is my view. You just may get you wrong. If I step on your toes, God will heal them. But it, there should be no church or no Christian that should ever split from a church based on how we vote. Why would I give President Trump or President Obama or Hillary the power to separate me from you when I'm worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? This is a broken system. He's a perfect God. I'm worshiping him. And so at City, I'm never going to tell you how to vote. I'll just tell you right now, probably half our church voted for Trump, and probably half of them didn't. And that's okay. I'm not here to change you. I got four kids, man. I'm trying to stay above water. I don't care what you do. Be holy and be legal. I don't care. Do whatever you do you. And we shouldn't get worked up about that. I'm not here to sway you politically. That's a waste of my time. I'm here to lead us all to be more like Jesus. You see, you and I have to see the big picture. How do we see the big picture? We refuse at city, at least at city, we refuse to be divided. I refuse to let our church be divided over nonsense. Have you noticed that our political system has terms? Think about this. Obama has, he led our nation for eight years. Historic. It was cool in so many ways. And for eight years he led. But he's come and gone. And those people are still gone from one another. 
How tragic. President Trump will come and go, and the next one will come. Why would we let anything like that separate you and I from eternity in terms of worshiping an eternal God? What we're saying is, is that our faith is more in a political system than in Jesus who we serve. I know that's strong, but it's true. This is all garbage. Man, we're serving God. We're lifting him high. He's the one that can fix this. And he wants his church to be together so we can model what this can look like so that the, you know, the, uh, the people that don't know Jesus can look at us and not say, well, they're not any different. They can actually look at us and say, man, they are different. They're doing life together. They hang out together. They go to each other's houses together. They marry each other. They do life together. They show a different hope. Shouldn't this be the church? Shouldn't this be what we do? You see, the enemy loves, here's what the enemy does. The enemy loves us to be black or white, Hispanic and Asian, Native American and white, Republican and Democrat, right, wrong, them, us. That's all the devil. God is us, we, together, one church, one voice, one heart, one mind, worshiping, praising, lifting God. That's God. This segmentation, the segmentation of race never came from God. It came from a system that is still flawed today. At City Church, we do this practically. We see the big picture that one of our core values is diversity. And this is a statement we have, and I'll explain it because it sounds kind of weird. We eat the meat and spit out the bones. In other words, we seek unity in our differences. Too many churches to me are cultish. A cult is everyone looks the same, thinks the same, votes the same, worships the same, does the same. And if that was the case, that scares me, and all of us would have a shaved head. And some of you don't have good heads to be shaved. I'm going to tell you that right now. You need hair. Come on, all right? Listen, we don't let politics divide us here. Check out, and check this out. We don't have to agree to unite. We don't have to agree to unite because unity is coming around a vision bigger than ourselves. Any successful marriage that's been happening for decades will tell you they don't agree on every point. But they've learned how to submit to one another and be a loving home. A loving home without a home that agrees on every point. A loving home is one that has seen a bigger cause than their point. And they are submitted and connected to one another. It's what we do here at City. We want to be a part of the move of God. Another core value is growth. We count people because people count. Another core value is acceptance. We make place for everyone. It, it, or we make a place for everyone here at City Church. This is why we're building a building. I said this last week. I told you stories. This is about life change. This is about people coming one way and being changed, and then together we move out together and we love people in a different way. That we have a bigger space for more diversity, more nations, more ethnicities, more, 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 more to let his name have fame and to show there is a better way. That we at City will embrace being uncomfortable. And at times, if you're around here, it will be uncomfortable. It will be tense. There will be differences of views. We want to have a life group set up for uh, racial topics to be discussed. We're gonna, I mean, music's going to be different than what you're used to from all types of background. That's okay. But we have to embrace being uncomfortable so that we can be healed. We actually have to cross the line, folks, and embrace not feeling, you know, whatever, so that we can experience what God wants us to experience. So we're going to embrace that here. And we're going to love it. Intention is a part of it. But we can get through it. We don't have to throw our hands up and say, I quit, and I don't want to be around you anymore. What, 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 what? If you're going to serve God, you're going to be around me, so you better start liking me. <laughs> In closing, I want to read a story to you. I, I, I told you one story. Here's another one. Different perspective. I came to IU in 2008 and was invited to City Church, and I finally came to the church, and it wasn't what I expected. I was used to an all-black church with only gospel music and black preachers. Because of the culture shock and the difference in music and it being a white preacher, <laughs> notice this, 
I decided while sitting in the service that I wasn't coming back. So I didn't pay attention to the rest of the service. After a few weeks, my friend invited me back, and I came for a second time, and I gave her the promise I would pay attention. The second time, I noticed everything. The people were welcoming. The message I understood. The Bible translation was easy to understand. The music was actually good. The media was amazing. I could use what I love to worship God. I came for a few months and got connected with some awesome people and finally realized that city being different was a blessing and not the barrier I thought it was. It showed me that I didn't only have to listen to one type of music, worship with only one group of people, and have church only one type of way. City gave me the freedom to lift my hands without being weird. I could sing as loud as I wanted because the music was so loud no one could hear me sing off key, and that's why we do that. And most of all, I could worship God through my gift. Folks, by no means am I trying to change America in the time I have with you, but what I am trying to do is stir you and I to take two steps. Two, every day. Look across the street. Look at the big picture. Don't let Sean Hannity or Anderson Cooper or Don Lemon or whoever else is out there get you worked up. Oh, Fox News, oh, CNN, oh. We're at home getting just worked up. Then we come and see someone in Starbucks or we see someone in the mall or at school and they're a different ethnicity and we got this, we got this angst. We got this, uh, we don't even know why. We don't even know these people. But we're all defensive because of a news affiliate who wants ratings stirring us up. How dare we let those pundits cause you and I to have barriers with other people? That's wrong. I don't care what they think. They'll be gone tomorrow. Who cares? I serve a God who will be here everlasting. I am worshiping God who will be here forevermore. People come and go. We are here to worship God. We're here to model what Jesus did. If we love a God we can't see, then we've got to love people we do see. I want to encourage you with this final statement, and we'll dismiss. In the fall of 2017, this is about six months ago now, my father was in Carolina, going to go to Carolina to have a joint, huge church meeting with about four churches. And one of those churches called the sponsoring pastor and said, um, if there's anyone there that's not white, we will not be attending, we will not worship with them. It was about six months ago. So my dad said, I'm not coming. I'm not, I'm not a part of that. We're not going to be involved with anything of that nature. That's totally wrong. I believe that grieves God. I believe that quenches the Holy Spirit. Those people are going to harm it. And they're going to have a hard time in heaven. This is real. And stuff happens every day. Based on a system and an ideology that permeates our nation. But Jesus is greater. Most churches and most people haven't even started looking across the street or to look at the big picture. What I ask you today to do, not change the world, do all this. I'm just saying right here, just one step. Look across the street. Have a conversation. Have a dinner. Grow past yourself. Expand your world. Get uncomfortable. Get, uh, do it on purpose to yourself so that you can grow in, in the love of God and see what Jesus sees. Be a part of city. Embrace what we're doing. And as we take our next steps with the new building, we're making more room and we believe that this will never, what we have will never leave because it's not about reaching an agenda. It's a, it's, a, it's a manifestation of who we are. My friends ask me, how do you have a diverse church? Almost like it's a goal on a list. It's not a goal on a list. It has to come out of who you are. 
has to be here. It can't just be, well, if we do A, B, and C, people will come. No. It's got to be, this is who I am. This is what I live. And from that, people are attracted to love. And that's what we can do. One step at a time. One person at a time. If you believe in this Jesus, give him a great hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Let's stand to our feet. You online, respond to God. As you're standing, please bow your head. You would say in this moment, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus and or I have, but I'm far from God and I want to, to change that today. Either one of those right now, as heads are bowed, if that's you, raise your hand. I want to pray for you to receive Jesus today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you in the back. People are coming to Christ. How many would say today, Pastor Dave, you know, I'm not saying any of us are a racist and that's and I hope you're not. But, but you would say this. You would say, Pastor Dave, I want to be challenged to cross the street. I want to look across the street. I want to look at the big picture. And I want to be a part of the solution for Jesus to touch people. If that's you and you want to do that, raise your hand right now all across this room. Thank you so much. Follow me in this prayer and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours and I run to you. For anything wrong, I'm sorry. I turn from that. I say yes to you. And through the Holy Spirit, one step at a time, I look across the street. I look at the big picture. I am yours. In Jesus' name.